uh, some of the things you was talking about just now in terms of our ability to travel, um, you know, and return and so forth. How, how do you connect well, that and how do you... I think we all do it. When we go to sleep, be it at night or day, daydream, night, revelation, or I wonder if, daydream kind of states, we all do it. And, and the things that come in from the side and from behind, a little random, like a little, just like a breeze blowing through. I wonder if, oh no, it can't be like that, but it is like that. And just to be able to hold on to it, how do you hold on to a wisp of smoke? Do you inhale? And in this book, Dr. Bynum talked about breathing practices. Mm -hmm. Breathing through your right nostril and your left nostril. Well, I've never heard such a thing. Well, that's how little I know. And in the dream state, I was—I remember studying about that and reading some of the occult literature that you could actually be in a different dimension, a different place, and then become conscious that you were still asleep. And you could have a dialogue. This active imagination could have a dialogue and talk to the realm and ask it to talk back to you. And then you can command your lower mind to hold on to the memory so that when you awoke, you could then. And the importance of writing things down as soon as you wake up. Some things you have to go up writing down. They ain't going to let you go. <laughs> You'll be chewing on for days and weeks thereafter. But the, but the fleeting thoughts, and also the, the importance about living according to the 42 affirmations, knowing that when you do wrong things, it throws your heart off and you close down the door of communication. You carry this residue that begins to cloud and begin with a broad brush to paint lies and falsehood and the opposites of way things really might be. Uh, so that, and, and also the need to watch out for rage because rage can really jumble the airwaves. And watch out for love. It can really clear it up. <laughs> it can really clear it up. But to be courageous enough to love, that takes some doing. Easy to get angry and stay angry. Hard to let it go. Easy to do, hard to do the right thing sometimes. To pay the prices that are being asked of you. When the wife showed up that time, boy, I just. Started running off in the mouth. I used to, I'd blame her for this and blame her for that and said all this and said all that. And all up, but I, as time went on, I couldn't remember all the bad. The good was still just like it was yesterday. Hmm. I wonder how as time went on, certain things stand tall, <coughs> certain things just fade away. Not that I, I forgot, but it didn't matter as much with the passage of time. So I, so I guess to ask the question of how do you hold on to it, I think, well, there are spiritual guides. You have to pray. I've got a lot more spiritual in that respect. Pray that you'll be blessed with revelations and, uh, and also to have, be able to laugh at your foolish self because things happen. So, oh, man, you missed that? Oh, yeah, you missed that. What's you need on this? <laughs> you know, so. And uh, do the best you can, and don't and, and don't worry as much as you can. Try not to worry about the stress. The stress. Mm -hmm. The stress. I watched my youngest son, who's a brilliant young man, and he's. But there's sometimes he beats himself up so severely, and I just say, man, just take it easy, bro. Just, just take it easy. So that's the answer I want to share on that. Um, my brother, Dr. King. Yes, sir. Um, stemming from what his question was based on, I know that people are trained to get out of body. Yes. What about not, um, when they decide to return and can cannot get back into their body? Oh, that's it. There's a there's a concept called the golden thread that says that when you leave your body in an astral plane that or one of these names, and many different names, 
and there's a golden thread that connects it, runs from your umbilical cord all the way back into your physical body from which you left. And if that cord is broken, then you cannot get back. Uh, I don't even know that. I know that when I was in my room and I realized how bad things were going for me with the renal failures, kids just stopped working, come up, put me on dialysis, and that those kids were filling up full of fluid. And I was coming and going, I said, don't look too good. I know that I, and I knew I already had some out of the body experiences more than once in each time during the day, especially at night. And I was afraid that I would not wake up or come back to this realm. And so I had, as all of us do when you get in times like that, I pray. God, if you just let me come on back, <laughs> please, please, please. I've been, as Sister Kevin, I've prayed before, you know. <laughs> There's some other calamities in my life. <laughs> and then when I prayed, I didn't hear a word back right then. I said, did anyone hear? What is it? Anybody listening? Anybody listening? <laughs> <laughs> I wonder what, if I can look at a book, I wonder what's going to happen on page, this next page. It was like a roller coaster. You're at the top of the dip and you get ready to Oh, I don't want to go down that dip. So I did, and I felt <coughs> that I was, I was crossing over. So I don't know, I don't have any words to give to you, brother, what to do to get back. But I do think we're not alone. They were surrounded by helpers and guides. And if they choose to let you come back, and if you go on to, to someplace else, it may be whatever that other place is going to be. You know, they, they talk about in chapter 125, look at coming forth by day, at the cyclostasia, the judgment scene, and we're all, I'm concerned that I don't want to be gobbled up by the crocodile <laughs> and to be just disintegrated, you know. I thought I've been doing, I have not been perfect. I'm not like a little seer. I ain't going to lay claim to that no way, you know. When I look at that list of things, I pass on most, but there's some I have to wonder about. Uh, so I don't, I don't know how we scale the way. I know that for certain, absolutes one day, that current will break. And one day there will be a crossing over. There will be that day will come. I don't know if I'll be ready, but I know I, I know what I would suspect. When that time comes, ain't nothing to talk about. Time to get on up and get on down the road. Whatever that, whatever that road might be. Uh, Dr. King, can I follow up with another question? Sure. Uh, the outer body experience on a different level by the name of bilocation. <coughs> Could you explain that for me? Uh, no, bilocation. I can't help you know, with that term, my brother. No, not. Oh, I mean that you're aware of two different locations. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Um, well, the I was reading of a case where um, a bishop went to preach at a church, and uh, he was he was engaged. He was a, he has an appointment for for another engagement to speak yes. to another church several miles away, yes. and he he consumed quite a lot of the time. So. He wasn't able to make it physical, so he fell asleep in his in his chair, and um, he appeared at the other spot, non-physical. Yes. And I understand it. He gave a brilliant um, presentation, and and that was the end of the story. So I just wanted to find out. Um, there was a when I. We're studying with the Aquarian Spiritual Center, which I, is the endless process. There was a, in these Gnostic studies, there was a fourth degree. And in the fourth degree, you were considered to be a traveling person. That you had the ability to materialize and dematerialize. And I said, well, he's, I'm a believer in Dr. Lagano, the works you have here. I don't know, I don't have conscious control of that. 
So he gave me the papers and said, here, this is your certificate. And I was living in North Carolina in Durham, and I was visiting back and forth in L.A. So I had to go back, that was I had to go back to Durham. When I got there, I went up to my study, and I put the paper on the desk. And I said, man, you know, you can be studying and you can believe, but not really believe. The paper disappeared. No one came up that study but myself. So maybe he took it back. And in the works of Alistair Crawley, who is a was a uh, white metaphysician, the House of the Golden Dawn, one of the ones who came out of that theosophical group, but who was a way out sex maniac and drug fiend and all that, but also a brilliant metaphysician. He wrote 777, many other books. He talked about visiting in Cairo. This has been the early 1920s. And he watched his master, named Theron, materialize in his hotel room. And he was and he was materializing from the star Silas. And he was a black man. And, and the upper portion was visible. But the, the torso, the arms, and face, he could see, but the other parts he could not see. Uh, the, in terms of the, the experiences that I had, I gave you the example of the two Africans who came to my assistance. I've never seen them before. They were 20-year-old, lish-looking African adult men. They seemed to be a small stature, like twa size, like three or two feet tall. And they came and put the white cloth on my head on either side. And then when I came out of the trance state, I realized I could ask, actually do that. It made a tremendous improvement for my condition. But then again, on the other side, when I would go into places and I would hear the sounds, there would be sounds that I would hear that would precede the out of the body traveling back in time to Kimber 10,000 years ago. <coughs> and then another time I had an MRI done. And I and in, our, in the MRI, you get into a long tube. And I'm a big guy, so I'm long. But anybody can get me in the tube. And when it starts off, it sounds like somebody's playing wooden xylophones. And I'm beating, beep, 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 beep. That was the same sound that I heard when I went into the trans state. So that suggests to me there must be, there may be some kind of electromagnetism involved in these shifts, energetic bodies going in dimensions. But to be conscious, if you, I've been able to sometimes be aware that I'm dreaming, and then I, and then come out of the fright stage, or like where am I stage, and then actually dialogue and ask them to share knowledge with me. And I've been aware of sometimes looking at manuscripts and then being amazed what I was reading and the brilliance of the revelations and then wanting to hold on to it but then not holding on to it because I wake up in a disbelieving fashion and I try to write it down. So training your mind, lower mind, to, to write these things and become more proficient is a matter of repetition. But I think it's also a matter of having, having guides. But I think there are others who have... And a lot of things that are written about it, it's fakery, because 90% of it is people just hustling and making money on trying to sell techniques and motions and, and, and certain things. Uh, I do refer people to the works of Pascal Beverly Randolph, but I have questions even then when he speaks about using the magic mirror to visualize people on the other side. And the magic mirror is having marijuana or other kinds of drugs and made up the make the mirror but saying that they could have conversations and could read people's thoughts and all these things. So I there's a lot more that has to be maybe that's the work that I have to do, I don't know. Uh, when Dr. Lagarde never told totally anyone this, when Dr. Lagarde, my older who was a teacher, was in his last days, and by that time he had uh, been placed, he had fallen and hit his head and had a skull, and based a skull fracture. That must be Dr. Ben. 
<laughs> and, and he had become, his memory had become very poor. And also his wife, when he came home from the convalescent hospital, had a reoccurrence of her colon cancer. She died within a week. And then he came, and so he came back, and uh, and he was with us for like another three years. But he, he also gave a history. He also gave a history. I just and he talked about he talked about traveling to other realms. He said that he was having an out of body experience. And he talked about uh, being able to that he that that that, 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 that was quite an event. He had uh, done a materialization inside of a a, a fly, or whatever. So I don't I don't know about all of that, but so I, on that I still feel like a novice, unqualified to answer that. Yes, Dr. Okay. Um, do you see a relationship between uh, neuromelanin and autism? Yeah, I see a relationship between neuromelanin and so many things. <laughs> so, Oh, yeah, for the, the autism, where children are born in the spe autism spectrum, and with their different levels of, of, of affliction, some may have, uh, may come across as being mildly, moderately, or severely retarded, mm -hmm. and have spastic movements. Uh, but this notion that neuromelanin acts to facilitate the myelin chief and the transmission of impulses efficiently from section to section is a critical, critical question. And the question of if there is a, I know there is a, a spirit body within a soul body that's inside, a spirit body inside of a soul body inside of a higher mind body that's inside of a lower mind body. That box within a box within a box. So if the physical body can't really express itself to the average person, and we would see that as autism, there may be something else that's quite intact on those other three soul, body, spirit realm. The spirit, because you don't take on material manifestation if you are a spirit, unless the soul body, unless the spirit is there. The spirit is the ultimate one, ultimate entity that's as bending space as your, as brother, the, the brother who did the um, unified field theory, Brother Clipson Brown talks about, mm -hmm. that you take, it always, life always exists, it always is. And when you occupy space, even as a human being, we're taking up space in the cosmos. And space is wrapped around us. Mm -hmm. And it has all these magnetic, gravitational components wrapped around us. And so, but, so that will be a tremendous advance, Dr. Brown, as you continue to do your work, showing the relationship between dark matter, dark energy, neuromelanin, and nerve transmission. You can get to see that operating on an individual level, which is certain to come. So that, that, that's quite a, quite a run. Dr. Uh, Professor Small, yeah, I think so you have yeah. any other Yes, ma'am. I, I got some issues. So you, you want to say a few words before you leave? I'm just glad to see Dr. King. Uh, thank you, brother. Thank you, brother. Lose the weight. Yeah, you've been coming <laughs> here. I've been listening to you this time. Okay, if you want to stay here and make the decision to stay. I made the decision to stay. Well, that's, that's the deal. You make the decision to stay. And then you stay. I will say. A brain like yours and a mind like yours that is developed as yours, we need it. Yeah. Give them all the matter. Well, I'm here to share it, but I'm here to share it. Being with Asa a few months before he left, um, and him and Wade and myself have been working with the school system out in Kansas City for about five years. But that last March, we were there. And he wasn't his usual self, so. How did he seem different? It was like sometimes he was there with us and sometimes he wasn't. So I asked him, what is going on? 
And what he said to me was that James, he says, oh, I'll talk to you when we get back to the hotel. But he didn't. When we got back, he says, oh, I've got to go to my room. But what he said in response to the question was that we're just spirits in transition. Mm-hmm. And that was what he said, we're spirits in transition. And then he says, and you got to do two things, tell people two things. That one, what people always do is build families. And that we must be very conscious that we are in the primary war we're engaged in is a culture war. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So those are the last three things um, before he left. But, you know, like, like you, I've had a lot of body experiences. So I know how that space, that, that's a special space. Um, and I've known people who just left. My mother just left. Mm-hmm. She wasn't sick or nothing. She just decided it's time mm-hmm. to go. My sisters and I thought she was joking. She said, I'm not coming back to your house today. She went back to the plantation where she was born. She went to the house where she was born. She sat in her mother's chair. She asked everybody to leave, said them all on an errand. Fifteen minutes later, they came. She was gone. Mm-hmm. She wasn't sick or anything. She was left. And my grandmother, before her, her mother, when she was leaving, she actually called me in the room and told me, she said, look, you got to take care of your mother. You got to take care of Carol. Because, you know, at that time, I wasn't so sure Carol and I was going to hang in this long because mm-hmm. I had to do my politics. And um, she says, I'm leaving. So I says, well, where are you going? And uh, at that time, she was about 98. But, mm-hmm. You know, a healthy 98 for South Carolina. And um, she says, I've been to the Jordan River. Mm-hmm. I'm looking going face. And I'm going to cross over. So I just said, oh, Mama, you ain't going away. You're going to bury me. I, I lied to her before about my funeral should be like and all this stuff. She said, no, sit down. She was blind, actually, for like many, many years. But this day she could see. Mm-hmm. And she described things on the pictures. She described the dress my sister was wearing. She told me she made that dress from the feed sacks. And she described And so that woke me up. But the lady said, it's the truth. And she says, I'm going. She said, and she said it again. I've been to the Jordan River. And I guess those were her frame of references. She says, I look in God's face and I'm across. So she gave me certain instructions. And, uh, and that was thanks to the list of because I wasn't going to be there. It was a Mother's Day. And I wasn't going to go home on that Mother's Day. I was speaking in Columbia. And I spoke on the Saturday. And then Saturday night, the list of Bell came to my room and says, Don't you have family down here? I said, Yeah, my grandmother. And I said, My mom's down there visiting. I was supposed to lecture at the church on Sunday. So he got on the phone, calls the preacher and said, We're canceling small Sunday lecture. So I began to protest, so, you know, I made an obligation, I'll keep it. He said, no. He says, you go see your mother. Mm-hmm. So I drove down to South Carolina the next morning, and that was what the old lady told me. And then I got back in the car, go back to Columbia, started flying back to New York that night. Perfectly clear sky. You know, they used to have plates on the plane and, and forks mm-hmm. and stuff back in the day. And we were having dinner, and I was the only black person on this plane, and it hit something. Boom! Mm-hmm. All of the dishes are flying everywhere. Everybody's panicking. And the father came on and says, well, we, we didn't get anything, and I can't, you know, he couldn't find out what happened. They said the weather was fine. So they began to clean up, and it happened a second time, and the stewardess began to cry, and that's when I got scared. I remember my knees going really fast. And there was nobody for me to hold on to because I'm the only black person and all the whites were hugging. <laughs> and so I held my legs and started praying to my grandmother. You know, I said, don't let me be crippled up, either kill me or don't let the plane go. But I don't want to be crippled. I down to my dialogue. Plane level off, got to New York. Everybody walked on the plane, never said nothing. That was the period when I stopped flying. You remember when I didn't fly and I took the trains out to California. And then Dr. Jeffries came and said there was a need to go to Ghana. This is their thing, remember, that's when we had the dream, and we had to go meet with all the chiefs and tell them that uh, our ancestor came in a dream and says, you got to build shrines for those killed in the Middle Passage so you, we won't come back home. <laughs> so I told the story to Dr. J. Dr. J called somebody in Africa, and they said, he comes to me with tickets, and I go, look, I don't fly. <laughs> so that night, the same grandma came in a dream and says, you don't have to be afraid anymore of flying. Mm-hmm. And I said, why? She says, your sister's going to fly your plane my elder sister's an ancestor by that time. And while we were standing in this field talking, J 
stealth, land this plane, and she comes out smiling with one of these old style helmets. Next morning, I was on the plane to Ghana and been flying ever since. Mm -hmm. But the, the space, you know, the, the, the frame of reference I make now is that we are all the divine having a human experience. Or, or better said, that we are an expression of aspects of the divine essence having a human experience. Because that's what you were talking about. That there is only one thing. And we are just parts of that one organism, which is all that is. You can't put a dimension to it because it's beyond our comprehension to it in terms of ending or beginning. And then much of our literature says the same thing. But my love for you, we go back a lot of years to a lot of things. Make the decision to stay. It's really up to you. And those little things that get in your way, it's like the discussion you were having about the, the negative confessions. We talk about the four, but we know there's many, many, many more out there. And so just eliminate the ones that's in your way. After the, the eating isn't, and the dieting isn't just a bad habit. It's, it's, it's a spirit that likes those things. It's like the teachers in yoga. Um, and, and you have to have a conversation with that element of yourself that you may like these things, but Richard's body can't handle it. You know? um, I remember one of those experiences I had was doing my Yoruba initiation into the precinct. And I was in the woods in a hut, and I think it was about the fifth day. You know, and you blindfold doing all that preaching, and you fast and doing that period. And something came in the hut and picked me up and spun me around and said, dance. Mm -hmm. And I started dancing to the drums and dancing to the drums. And then it spun me again, and I could feel the wind when it goes, because I'm a child of Oyan, I'm a priest of Oyan. And so when, when it goes, I kept dancing, and I hit my shin. And I thought I was in this place all by myself all these days, except occasionally someone would come and chant, and I would, the drums were always playing. But when I hit my shin on something, a bench or something, somebody grabbed me. So there were attendants in the room, um, and he says, number one, um, do you want to sit down? I said, yes. And he sat me. Then he says, do you want some water? And I said, yes. And I remember when the glass hit right there, and then nothing. And the next thing I know, I don't have on a blindfold. And somebody was anointing this leg, and somebody this <coughs> leg, and someone had this arm, and someone had this arm. And the chief priestess was possessed by Baba Luay. You know, they call it Shakpan, who deals with the, the, they said the goddess of smallpox, but it really is the spirit that brings the poison out of your system. Because that's what smallpox does. All those little pimples are the poison, actually. So she was rubbing something into my forehead the medicine and someone else had a tray. And I remember what she said, she says, this is my son. I came to you weeks ago and said, prepare the medicine. You didn't do it. And says, now you know I need the medicine. And he says, I can take him when I want him and I can bring him back when I want him. I'm talking about what you were saying. I went to Kim at once from my living room floor. Didn't have any control. Almost had a heart attack. I never, I, I would have died had they kept me longer. And they brought me back. And the second time they took me, I wasn't as frightened. And they held me differently <coughs> that time. You know, I'm, I'm saying there, I don't see none of this. Someone behind with me cradled. And I went to Kemet. And we let, got to Abu Simba. And then we went over to Luxor. And we went to the valley. And then he pulled me away. All of it was African. And as he pulled me away, it was all turning white. Mm -hmm. European. And... Then they says, now you know what the work is. Then they brought me back to my living room. So I know what they cement. We are spirits in transition. And so I've had at least two clinical death experiences. I have a good understanding of this better than I had, not as good as one should. Um, you've been all the way on the other side. I mean, I, I hear you talking, but... Um, if you didn't cross over, you're sitting like your foot in the water. It was in the water. Okay. Um, and we are the divine having this experience. We are all aspects of the divine having our peculiar 
responsibility. The Yorubas call it um, your destiny. Before you leave the divine to become human, you decide on what your purpose is here and what your destiny is going to be, and then you're held accountable to do that. And when you complete that, then you go back, not to some mythical kind of heaven thing, but you become a part of the great thing again, the, the, the great energy again. So I'm glad to see your spirit and Sister Kepa told me you were coming. I was very happy, even though family has gone through some crisis. We had somebody in the family yesterday who had to go through nine hours of surgery, but a lot of not too very um, good possibilities mm -hmm. right now, so I need to, to go back home. But um, the, um, I love you. And as we struggle through trying to learn how to be African, the one thing we do learn is that we have to know how to love. But <coughs> in the context, then I know people in the, the Judeo-Christian Islamic culture we talk about loving, um, but I hope I'm going beyond that statement of loving. Um, that, that is love without discrimination. I'm loving with discrimination. Okay, I'm clear on what I'm loving and who I'm loving. So that, that's my contribution, just being in your presence. And exactly. I remember how much you taught all of us when we didn't had never heard the word melanin. Because this guy <laughs> talking about this melanin thing. Because of, what is that? You know, get to this guy's feet and begin to learn about what makes us godly. Mm -hmm. You know, and that's what you brought to us and you're still bringing it. So you have to decide whether you're going to get tired on the job or whether you're going <laughs> to lighten up and finish your job. You know, I'm here for the duration, but let me decide. Uh, okay. But I gotta just ask you a quick question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They would Take care. sisters, forgive me. Is there such a thing as predestination? In other words, can you talk a little loud or something? Yeah. Oh, I'm so sorry. Yes, I'm sorry. I'm asking, I'm in my mind, I'm thinking, you speak of going to a certain point and then coming back. I'm wondering, do we have any real control? Or is this predestination? Are we placed here and the Creator has decided you're here for a purpose. I expect you to fulfill that purpose. It could be for a day. You find children, uh, infants who are, are born and pass almost immediately. Uh, those who live till 98 years of age. Is it predestined that, or is it our belief that there's a predestination as to the time that we spend here? I would, first of all, say I don't know. So here he says, my, my beliefs and guesses. In terms of my recent experience, I knew things were going bad. I could have listened to my son who told me, Dad, you need to go to the hospital today. He told me that for days on end. I didn't know. I was getting worse day by day. If I hadn't, if John Griffin hadn't told me I should go right to the emergency room, after a minute, I considered, well, I can go tomorrow, but this is the man who writes my paycheck. Why don't I go now and let me come back here? And so I, I knew I, he, he had me cornered, and for a minute I knew I said, he has good judgment too. He's a fellow, he's a PhD psychologist, and I couldn't, and I could hear in my own voice how my speech was becoming slurred. I was aware that I was taking time. I was writing my prescriptions and I would <coughs> almost fall asleep while I'm writing the script. And my patient would say, Are you okay, Doc? And I said, Yeah, I'm okay. <laughs> <laughs> and after this had happened three times with the same patient, <laughs> you know, I should have known something. But the, I do also want to hold on to the belief that we have endless. Not endless, okay, we keep we're given opportunities. And I sometimes when I feel myself at a crossroads, and I've been told that there is a God who stands at that crossroad. Not the God, a God. Africans call him Lee Egba. We call him the trickster. Is it gonna be a treat 
or trick. Are you going to treat yourself or are you going to trick yourself? And not all treats in that instant uplift you. Some of them are demanding. And some of the things that taste good, like being that food problem, mm -hmm. that taste good right then is a trick. It's going to wreck you, tear you up bad. So I've seen, I've seen that happen with the tricking and the treating. And, and I've seen things like there was another time in my life where I almost died. Another time. And I, this is a quick review. I woke up one morning and I felt like it, I, was a, this was, I was in my 20s in med school. And I thought it was Christmas like it was when I was seven years old. Everything was beautiful. Everything had sparkle to it. It's as if whatever wish I wanted was going to be granted that day. It was a, as we all know, it was a, if, if this was a thing for bipolars who were in their euphoric, grandiose phase, which we, we treat, my brother and I, we treat that all the time. We know we can't touch it with medications and try to get a person to go along with that. The feeling tone wins every time. But a side thought came in. Pay attention. This is a special day. Something's going to happen today. I don't want you to think about it. <clears throat> so later that day went on and on and on. In addition to being a medical student, I was in love. <laughs> <laughs> With my girlfriend who had come up from Whittier College while I was a med student there in UC San Francisco. I was carrying on, you know, and she had been, she loved me to no end. But I was cutting up on and we used to live together and I had been in the nation of Islam. And I wanted my freedom again because I was not even 25 and I wanted to sow some wild oats. I was hypnotized by the TV what I saw on TV. I wanted with the TV image of an exciting romance. So all that said and done, she had moved down and she was an attractive lady at UC Berkeley. And she had a new boyfriend, <laughs> <laughs> which I didn't want to accept. I was going to lose her. And he was a professional prize fighter named Cougar. So I didn't want to tang with him either. <laughs> <laughs> and so she came out and visited me one day at my separate residence. And I drove her back. And as we got out of the car, when I saw her to her apartment, <coughs> we flicked the light on, and there was the, the new boyfriend standing at the end of the hallway. <laughs> all six foot three of them. <laughs> and I suspected he was going to try to dominate her and to make her come back to him because she had asked for her key. And next thing I know, he had grabbed me and popped me upside the head. <laughs> <laughs> and we were wrestling in the hallway. And I didn't want to hit him, but I said, man, this guy knows how to fight. He can kill me with his fist. Mm -hmm. And I fell to the ground, and he started kicking me inside of my face. I said, oh, no, you ain't going to put up this up. And I jumped up, and I went looking for the gun that her other boyfriend, he would come back from Vietnam and brought. <laughs> a 32 automatic. And I was going to get that gun. I was going to get crazy with it. And she had been a good, thankful sister had taken the bullets out of the gun. And so we couldn't do that. But I began to carry the gun in my personal cell. Here I'm a medical student carrying a gun in my jacket. Because if I saw that rascal, I was going to fire his behind. <laughs> he was calling me on my office and telling me I should stop going. I said, I got something for you, sucker. Come on, bud. <laughs> a crazy thing, you know. And so one day I was showing her, a few days after I was showing her how to move the car and park it into a parking space near where I live. As I leaned over, the gun fell out of my pocket. Mm -hmm. That was the same day I had that special feeling in my mm -hmm. It hit the ground. I smelled the gunpowder before I even heard the sound. Mm -hmm. A 32 automatic went off, and it went through my, the base of my thumb that came out the side of my wrist. This hole the size of a nickel. 
blood flying everywhere. And I looked at that. I said, oh, man, you'll be paralyzed for life. You shattered your wrist bones. You're done with. You know, you're going to be, you're going to be, uh, you're going to be disabled. I went to the emergency room at my med school, and they looked at me like, here come another Negro coming in with a gun. I said, I said, I said, I said, I and they, then they tested my hand as I was going to be examined. He began to breathe the wound. I'm looking at my tendons and whatever else inside his gaping hole and all the blood. And I noticed I could still move my fingers, and that's impossible. It's impossible. The surgeon was so surprised, he took photographs of it. Mm, gotcha. And then I said, remember what happened this morning? You've got something to do with it. Don't blow it. God's if you kept on your path, you would be you would end up in prison or dead or, or or whatever else. So I think that yeah, there is, as I've experienced in my own personal life, there is on some levels records of of what the choices are and what and their different paths. And maybe in a parallel dimension there is a Richard King who's paralyzed in his left hand from acting a fool. But Richard King who is doing 30 years of life for killing somebody who threw his medical school life away in a parallel universe. There's Richard King, because people, when I told my friend, you know how gossip goes, and people started coming around, one of my friends, a fellow psychiatrist who was fighting a clinic, looked at me like, and I, I realized she was looking at my head because she heard somebody had mispronounced the word hand, and they said he got shot in his head. <laughs> and he was looking for the gate oh. indentation, you know. But uh, I think there is. Mm -hmm. there, there are records that are written. Mm -hmm. And so we, we do have choices. Mm -hmm. And we're going to continue, but I think uh, we need to break to have something. And most of us had a question on it. Oh, yes. Well, make it right. then, brother. Um, That's the question I just want to know if there are any medications or procedures that we have to be careful with, as you know, from your, you know, from your perspective, uh, you know, Okay, thank you. Females won't email everyone else. Sure. In, you know, in, in terms of... In terms yeah, psychiatric medicines and procedures, are there any that, we, that you feel we have to be careful with? Well, I, I think uh, it comes with the diagnosis. I'm not with different... I think that we have to revisit our diagnostic categories. And there are a lot of things that our people are sharing with terms of their experiences that we have been miseducated about as to how, what that means as a diagnosis. And so that the, what does it mean for a, a person to lose a loved one and to still have the loved ones come to them day and night? Is that an hallucination? Is that a spiritual experience? And what does it mean for a patient to be able to confide that to us? Does it help build rapport? If they can talk about that without us being judgmental or putting it or, and so that's a critical one. The other one about the the other uh, the di the link between post traumatic stress syndrome and bipolar disorder. Man, I have really greatly expanded my appreciation for bipolar NOS. Oh man, and the bipolar mix, and the other one, the uh, the PTSD, the the uh, the and borderline also, personality disorder borderline. And trauma. Yes. Yeah. Oh, it's greatly expanded that. The use of of using small doses, things like Abilify, in concert with antidepressants, is fabulous. I have misdiagnosed a lot of depressive states. He didn't come across as somebody being slowed down. So here comes Dr. Ben right now. Oh. Yeah. So much. Please hold. I'll be heard. Can we have the cords up? Yes. Go ahead. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you know, treating my son, man. Yeah, he's treating my son. Yeah, he's now. He did so much better, man. He's now. Yeah. You probably heard he's talking to Dr. Ellis also, man. Yeah. Yeah, man. So I would definitely call him and I would share that. Oh, yeah. 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 Yeah.
<laughs> Eating too much, <laughs> dog. <laughs> All right, he got you. I'm getting plants. In about ten months, I walk alone. Beautiful, brother. Walking great. He, 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 oh, no, no, he told me how to do it. I've been seeing it for the longest time. It's your way for you, Dr. Right Our destiny, we want to take advantage of every moment that we have to talk about those things that are meaningful to us. So we say, our God, you are our God, and we give you praise and honor because you know us better than we know ourselves. You love us when we didn't even love ourselves enough to do the things that we should have done. We thank you for allowing us the breath of life that belongs to you. We thank you for your excellence and for your greatness. In this circle, we ask you to come and radiate yourself and to be with us, heal us of those things that need healing and cause those things to rise up in us and around us and in our environment to give us the experiences that we need at these crucial moments in time in history. We are thankful for Dr. Ben. We are thankful for um, um, uh, um, the school and the work that uh, Cheryl has been doing. We thank you for Avini. Uh, we thank you for Dr. King. We thank you for Ann Brown that we are able to look at her wonderful face and all the traumas and things that each one of us individually have been going through. Thank you for um, the household here and the preparation of the food that's going for the nourishment of our bodies. Uh, we belong to you. You say, you are mine, and indeed, we are yours. And that relationship is so special, and we ask that we have a deeper interpretation of the spiritual experiences that we are having, uh, because we know that you are capable in us to decode the mysteries of life. We need you the ever more because while we have the breath of life, we want somehow to pass on to the next generation the sacredness of who you are and the experiences for we are indeed spiritual beings. Bless the food and not only this food but the entire body. Go down to the nano cells in us and regenerate new life. Amen three times. Amen. 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 In this community, very significant in terms of uh, uh, activism. Samori Marksman, you know him all. He passed away. And got a heart attack. And stress. And those are the complications sometimes that we neglect. And as I was saying that you can be a revolutionary, but the most important thing is that keep your health because we you got to survive tomorrow or longer. Now there was Dr. Amos Wilson, the same same story. Same story. Uh, and the other day I had the privilege to go to St. Luke's Hospital. In fact, I was going to check myself out, but I. I just decided that uh, look, I heard that the lumber broth is, is nearby here, so let me go see him. And I was kind of hesitant, you know, it's like sometimes a uh, person in, we are told that the person is comatose, and, you know, is, but I just said, let me go. So I, he asked, I said, uh, the lumber broth here, he said, yes, it's upstairs at 6 o'clock, so I, I walked up upstairs. And I uh, got there, yes, he was, you know, it's like, but I spoke to him. I said, the Lombe, um, Molefe, the brother from South Africa, and you've done a great contribution to us. And, uh, and he said, ah! mm. but he couldn't, you know. So I, I, then I, 
said something, I said to him that, uh, look, I'm here to really encourage you, and uh, if at all possible, uh, you are strong. And he's, he made that sound again. Mm -hmm. And then I stepped off and, you know, stayed there for a while and left. Now, that's just a coincidence here, the question that I'm asking. Yeah. The longer I got a stroke, I hear the wife got a stroke at the same time too. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, in terms of uh, coincidence, in terms of PPP, you know, the, the numbers in terms of the billion and what, I mean, husband and wife get a stroke at the same time. You understand know, me that they have the same stress? Yeah. Same, uh, or it's something that is more induced from outside that could be. That's my question to you. Well, I get several things. In this day of high technology, just relax. our okay. adversary always, but always, is choosing weapons of destruction first. How to kill the opposition. He's done, he and she, he and she, has done so much stealing their own doing, they know that somebody's coming for them tomorrow or today. So they're always very paranoid and very hyper-vigilant trying to practice genocide. They are gods of destruction. So that's, that's a reality. On the one hand, then on the other hand, I don't want to become paranoid about living, that I'm under surveillance. One of my friends, Bob and him, had talked about people being under psychic surveillance. People who use their ability to, of astral projection to listen in. Mm -hmm. One of my relatives, I won't say who, has been actively involved with the federal government for years and is aware of intelligence agencies that spy on us electronically. Mm -hmm globally, and he often laughs because they receive more information in than they can analyze. They don't even know how to weigh what the information that's become. They flooded with their day-to-day -day intercepts. And yet, on the other hand, as you give that particular example, usually people are very closely bound to each other on a hard level. So to hear that her husband has had a stroke, that is a severe stressor. Mm -hmm. And it can be managed. One could also say that maybe there's a death angel that's coming knocking on your door. I'm just trying to go through a list of possibilities. And there may also be that certain people are trying to work bad karma, voodoo, hoodoo. I don't want to get into all, I don't want to get paranoid. <laughs> I don't want to get paranoid, but you wonder, give this a rascal in the pot someplace, you know. And so there's a need to be vigilant and to have your guardians around you at all times. Uh, but the thing that is more practical, that is certainly is practical, the this, this simple thing of keeping your blood pressure record three or four times throughout every day, morning and certainly night, and keep on a record, a diary is life saving. Your body will answer within thirty within an hour or two if the foods that you ate that day was right for you or not. If your pressure goes up, you got your answer. If your pressure if you receive a letter in the mail, are you worried about it? You know, I'm, I'm saying, no, I'm not worried about that letter. But my press jumps 20 points. I am worried about it. Some part of my psychic apparatus is aware. I need to, on, if, if, I, if there's some external psychic viewing, so your body has alarm signals that are visually keeping post of where we are. And it's so, I've had patients come to see me. I know Dr. Lewis has the same story and others of us who are in that medical thing. One guy came to see me when I was in San Francisco and he was breathing very <clears throat> harshly. It was raining outside and he wasn't going to go to the hospital to get his breath treatment. He had emphysema severe. And the next day he never woke up. So respiratory rate is another thing to keep track of. I could have kept track of my respiratory rate. In my state of denial, 
I didn't want to, I can hear my voice slurry. I'm weird. So that's just food in my, in my teeth. That's not food in your teeth, food. That's mm -hmm. something weighing on your brain. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I remember having the awareness of a headache in an odd part of my head. And I said, oh man, you probably having a little minor bleed. There ain't no such thing as a minor, minor bleed. <laughs> <laughs> Anything is life threatening. Another one, you can get these glucose strips. And I have a patient I have to call talk to twice a day. She's one of my patients. She is a part of her personality called, there's a glorious Carmela Dozart. And then there's a part of her that's called Fifi. Fifi's a rascal. It wants, it's the angel of destruction trying to overturn her good work. So every, on the third day, she's going to get the wrong foods. And when I talk to her about the foods, she's going to try to fabricate and embellish or remain silent about what she actually did. So it's good to keep a detailed diary because our conscious mind is being influenced by the lower mind and the higher mind. In the conscious mind, you might unintentionally forget three hours later what you ate. So it's good to keep a detailed diary. The f oh, that wasn't anything when I had that potato with butter on it. I don't know why you mention that. That's not even a problem. Besides, I like that too much to ever give it up. So I'm not going to tell nobody about that. So the foods that we eat and the stresses that we had. I was under stress. My youngest son was having a hard time in school. He, had, he was smoking brand X, whatever that is. And he was cutting up. And I knew he was floundering. But I didn't want to admit that to myself. I knew that I should have gone to visit him and with my own two eyes. As a parent, your own body, you can feel your children when things ain't right. You, you know. Anybody got to tell you? And so I didn't follow suit. But not that I could be there for everything. So I guess what I'm saying, there are, there are a simple, me easy to do measures like blood pressure, Respiration, glucose checks. Ah, but the important one, keeping a daily dream diary. Keeping a daily dream diary. Because it does look ahead two or three years, two or three days, two or three hours. And the dreams that wake you up in a fright, we don't, we don't, we, everybody's going to remember those. But the ones that seem to be nonsensical, with no pattern to them. If we see two or three of those, pay attention, ask yourself, and the, the, the memories come to you during the day. I was walking, I said, well, how far should I walk? Should I walk through two laps, three laps, four laps, six laps? And I'm walking on the track, and one of those fast walking sisters passed me up. She says, how you doing, brother? I said, I'm doing fine. He said, I'm, I'm getting ready to end my walk, I'm walking six laps. But my goal is to walk eight. And I talked to somebody else, he says, her goal is 12. Well, I took that as a spiritual signature. That was telling me what my goal should be. So I am trying to do some of the same. But it, all that said and done is, we're at the age now where transition takes place if you're not careful. And when it happens, it's catastrophic. So to catch it in the bud, before that roller coaster goes over the top of that hill and goes to the next valley. And Doc is a living example. When I saw Doc last time, he wasn't able to even verbalize about things. Mm -hmm. And Doc, you must have a, you have a great work yet to do. Because you, you have fun. And with Dr. Lewis's care and the love of your family and community, goodness. Well, what I found to be what has been unique to me, oh, none of, not, I have not one of my children visit me. Mm -hmm. I am free of children. <laughs> Neither my twin, my three children from my first wife, they don't say anything. Of my second wife, when I got divorced from her, they, they don't talk to each other, the children, so they don't talk to me. There's two, and the third one, children, the last, 
None of the two talk to me and don't talk to themselves. Kwame and Correct. Kwame live here in New York. <coughs> Colette was living in Chicago, but her husband, they said that she killed him. <laughs> she lives in Alabama. She doesn't be like me. <coughs> and I go to visit her mother. Her mother had a child that she has, she, and she is t supposed to know, tell me the child born in the room and point out to me the room. I don't remember any child there. So I know like a fool trying my best to put one plus one together. Then they move me from up in the Bronx where, where they had located and bring me down to Manhattan. Bring me back in the same place that I leased. I live in the same place that I leased and I don't have to pay a dime. That place for $400 a month I used to pay. No, I don't pay a dime. I got the library still there, but I, I don't control a thing, don't nothing. All my jewelry from the from Egypt, mm -hmm. don't know none, don't oh. see them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Last night, last night, a fellow came away. I supposed to have taken his mother to Egypt. Mother lives in Ghana now. She moves over there, but it, it showed. She showed. He showed her the picture, and she pointed out myself that I'd been good to her, and that, and so now he brings five dashiki, a brand new dashiki, which was given to me. Of charge and some radio, but now I don't have to do anything, and now I have it, everything done. But I don't know where the money come from. <laughs> I feel I like a lost person. Mm -hmm. They said I don't know where I'm sleeping and how I'm sleeping. I wake up in the morning and wash. And wash when they want to wash me. And how they want to wash me. Tonight, I, I, Dr. Lewis came. I was happy they come. A surprise has come. I have a day where he has come. But I forgot that Richard is supposed to do on, fr on Friday. Mm -hmm. I then said, let's go, get ready to go. But the girl does know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. She is suddenly. Then I didn't know, remember, that he's coming. Mm -hmm. I have my teeth to, to go to the hospital. I'm, I, I got all my teeth made. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, just suddenly, I was supposed to get the teeth this weekend. Mm -hmm. Suddenly, the teeth have been put up for two weeks, mm -hmm. and then they told me that, that I get it next week mm -hmm. instead of two. Something is wrong. The, uh, the young man that brought you the dashiki is Tamunye's son, Shaka. I thought it was, I thought it was and yeah. yeah. Yeah, Shaka. He's the one who brought the things to you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And Chester and his wife came. They were very helpful, but I said, I don't know nothing. I don't come. I have no idea who, who why. No, the, the mother, I, I, he gave me a picture. I don't remember. She could be at City College. Maybe, but I don't remember. Okay. 
I, 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 I am lost to what is happening to me. And then, first, when Dr. Dick Fitch comes there, he used to be uh, the young man that was with Dr. Dick Fitch. Um, really? Yeah. He used to come to me, and no, I don't hear nothing. You see, things are happening so suddenly. Okay. And everything. My, I don't have my, my social security number. Uh, <coughs> it's clean. I don't have the old age number. I found one the other day. And I put it away, give it to somebody to keep from me. Since I gave him my social security, I've had a number of people calling me, none of which I know. I have people who call me in the morning and night and leave messages to come near and I don't know them. <coughs> and then something comes that says, you know, a friend of his says, Richard King is coming to see you tomorrow. That was, I had a funeral last yesterday, and before that, well, day, day before the funeral, <coughs> Tuesday, I said, Richard King, what happened to him? He said, your friend Richard King. I said, what happened to him? He said, Richard King was sick. And the hospital I said, sick. He said, yeah, man, don't you know Richard King was dying? Um, I had a stroke. I said, what? his wife is it, is it the stewardess on the airline? He said, yes. I said, Richard King. Richard King's son is here in college. I, he says, he's not in college. He said, He's come by to see you. I said, tell them to come. <laughs> then tonight when I'm getting ready to sit around, the guy said, Dr. Lewis is downstairs to see you. I said, why? He said, he's come to see you. So when I listen and I heard Dr. Lewis, it is to come to I received him with my skin and said, well, how is that with And I said, that's it, too. But then I would say, you go in. I said, where do you go carry me with this tool? I need a tool to walk with and you got to fill up the trunk it with, the, with the car. He said, no, we're going to walk like that. I said, what? <laughs> 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 that was it, the, 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 the whole thing. I said, I'm going to walk. <laughs> so, I said, you did. You, you, that, that, I said, I'm going to do what? Oh, and, I said, do you know that the three things to work with him, and the people can't guarantee me these three things, one don't have a key. <laughs> the other is, is the thing is certain. And this the, the poor apparatus has got something broken. Something not broken with it. And tonight I just got a lady who was assigned to me, no longer assigned to me. And one came back the first day. And all are from someplace else. <laughs> I said, none, I know where they came from. I said, you know, when you bury me, bury me. But don't carry me, but don't carry me, I kill me up there in the street. And then they found all kind of excuse that I had urinated myself and I did I said, I mean, no can I said, you're going? to the train, I said, on the trip. Then Dr. King brought me here. And the trouble to come here was bad enough. But then 
I thought to still be relaxed because it was at the, I said, we live for going with Christopher Kepper He said, yes. I said, oh. So when he came in, I forget going to walk right in, but then I had to step up mm -hmm. to come here. Then I could have never step up by myself. Mm -hmm. When I came down in the place of coming down here, I said, going down in there. <laughs> so when I came down here and I looked in the room and I saw Richard King, I said, that's Richard King. I said, that's Richard Kappa. And that's the so and so and so. And I couldn't believe then I do here watching her. <laughs> then I keep watching her. She, she looks at she, she looks at like somebody I know. <laughs> <laughs> and I looked and I looked and said, Oh, this I'm wrong. <laughs> Just like that. And she was surprised that I had hello because I had not seen I'm wrong for the longest while. But we, we, that, I, since that, I sat here and so much come back to me mm -hmm. that I understand what you mean by a dead. Mm -hmm. be dead yeah, and sure. alive. Yes. 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 Okay. 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 Next. Yes. And you have to see that. I just love Dr. King to say a little bit more about melanin because that's, the, he, that's our topic yeah. wherever topic we go. Melanin, I, he brings good I've stuff. I've been blessed, I think, recently to run into some deeper revelations. And as I was hearing someone talk at the table just now while being on a trip with Dr. Ben to Kemet and there, some years ago, and they were watching, and a, and a white group was close by in the, in the Great Museum of Cairo. And the white, some, some white woman asked, why is that statue black? Mm -hmm. And somebody went off with some way wrong answer. And the point here, that Dr. Ben turned around because he was black. black. <laughs> <laughs> so in that same note, mm -hmm. that our people understood <laughs> the science mm -hmm. of blackness yeah. profoundly. So when I heard about the Anu, and I saw that inscription written uh, that that uh, about the about one of the, that's that's in Abydos on the mural showing a a a new nobleman and it was and it, and they said then later the a new their center one of their cities was this place that was called Hil for want of a better word Hilopolis also misnamed Om. When I asked Brother Farouk's cousin, who took us to Luxor, I asked him, what about the Anu? He said, Anu? Oh, you mean the Yo Ono? Mm -hmm. And then he could relate to it under that name. Mm -hmm. But this place and people of the, of the pillar, who came, and then I read in your book, Doc, the Black Mother Now book, he had it all right there. Mm -hmm. But I hadn't been blessed to see with my mind even though I've read the book 10 times, mm -hmm. if not 20. Mm -hmm. And he is right in there that these were the people who came from the Great Lakes region. Mm -hmm. And he even pointed out places in Uganda, Tanzania, mm -hmm. and Kenya, and the Great Lakes region. They came from that place, and that was from the heart of Africa. And he said they were not Hamites. <laughs> they were not black Caucasoids. <laughs> they were not nilotic Negroes. And Dr. Benson in his book don't even use that word Negro at all. That's right. <laughs> and, so, and then I had also read in other places about what Sister Kefani had given. I saw, I found on the floor at Dr. Lagan's bookstore an article that had been published here in Harlem by the Harlem Study Group in the 60s on the evil use of the name Negro. Mm -hmm. And it's even published not by Black Classic Press. Mm -hmm. And it talks about it means slave. Mm -hmm. And it's of a recent 1600 vintage 
And then as I read in Black Metal the Now, it said the name that was given to the continent that we now name Africa, which was not known as Africa, that was in honor of Romans celebrating Scipio Africanus, mm -hmm. defeating the Car the Car hardest General Hannibal at the Battle of Azama. Mm -hmm. But this was the name they gave for themselves was Al Kabulon. Mm -hmm. Al Kabulon. So that was the name of Dr. Menachem Simmons' corporation, Al Kabulon. So I realized more and more the great works that have been done by our elders who opened these doors. And so when I was studying with Dr. Lagan, when I began my study on melanin, I said, Doc, I want to study melanin. So from a, from a black metaphysician standpoint, he says, well, come over here. He took me to a book called Goodwin's Kabbalistic Encyclopedia. And this was a book that was based upon the Zohar, which was the Moses had took but it really came out of the Egyptian University in terms of the how and divination and evocation. Mm -hmm. And the other, so when you open the book Sacred Tarot by C.C. Zane, you read about other elements in this thing that were come up on the Sephardic Jews in Spain and last put in writing. But he took me to the thing under the word door, D-O-R. Another name for door was Daleth. D-A-L-E-T-H. So then as I did further study, I, when I went to Abydos and I was walking through the door, going from the outer chamber of the, of the temple to the inner door, there were no walls, there was no archway, but there was a black stone in the ground called the threshold of the door. And when I walked from the middle chamber to the inner chamber, there were no walls, no left pillar, no right pillar, no archway, but there was another black pillar made from rose granite, black granite with flecks of red. Now remember that granite, that's the same color granite that made up the king's chamber. All the walls, the ceiling and floor made of black granite with flecks of red. So I said, well, what is this red doing in black? And what is this concept of a threshold in a doorway? So then when I read your work about melanin, and when I read with Bruce and them, it said that melanin in the brain is a bioluminous thing. It gives off radiant colors. So from blackness, light is born. There is transmission. The same thing as the black retinal pigmentation in the retina where it's taking light, be it, be it light that's going to be translated into color or, or black and white vision. Mm -hmm. It's translating all these sensory inputs. And then I realized that all epidermal surfaces have a melanin layer underneath it. So that be it smells in the olfactory bulb, be it sounds in the inner ear, the melanin lining of the cochlear membrane, epithelial membrane, be it melanin <clears throat> lining the internal lining of the cerebral ventricular fluid chambers mm -hmm. from which cerebral spinal fluid is made, mm -hmm. that all of these are doorways mm -hmm. for sensory translation that are then taking it in an energetic form which is being processed by a higher part of our spiritual experience. And whether you want to call it a micro black dot, was that the dot that was placed as the Bindu's Bin Bin stone? Was this the Bin Bin bird flu? I don't know. Is that the locus surrealis? <coughs> I don't know. But there's something greater and much grander than this fleshly vehicle. And so the Anatomical body is sacred, and that's important. But within that anatomical body, there's a chemical set of transmissions. And then within that, there's an electrical set of transmissions. And in that, they, who knows, I, I say again to you, Dr. Ann Brown, how is black matter and black energy working across the cosmos? Is it passing through a melanin door? 
Are we going through wormholes in space? Going into other dimensions? All of it called Ra and the Supreme Being. I, don't, I have more questions than I have answers. But work to be done. Mm -hmm. The answers is bless us with revelations yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. as we go along. So I think they, 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 they know. Mm -hmm. Be blessed with revelation as we <coughs> proceed. So it's uh, a lot of questions. I know that in my traditional experience uh, of going through the medical education, that's valuable. And I want to be thankful of that. But I know for whatever reason, you know, it's something if you're a billionaire and the spirit world won't bless you with a revelation to put A and B together to make C. You know, and then here comes a janitor in your office, and he's he or she is blessed with put A and B and C, and they're children. So you're going to Harvard, <laughs> and you're going to 125th Street, or Crenshaw Avenue, or whatever, whatever your place might be, or you're going to places... Back home in Aswan, places back home in Ghana, places back home in South Africa, or even places back home in Goma, in what is now the Congo, or places of my people. I wonder often why my people named Homa, Louisiana. Was it because they were, that's the way they pronounced it, Goma? And they had some roots <coughs> that went back there? I don't know. But my ancestors, my great grandfather on the male side was a blacksmith mm -hmm. and he was a traditional blacksmith mm -hmm. and he taught all five of his sons to be blacksmiths and I know that my middle name is Devoid yeah. which means in English without mm -hmm. so I said maybe when he signed us up at the end of the Freeman's Bureau at the Civil War that was the crack was still trying to signify that it was still a black man mm -hmm. But then I later learned, maybe that, that probably was true, who knows. But also the middle name relates to a French way. De, devoid means in French doing the capable of doing the work of. Okay. But I know the idea of the D of that door yeah. stood stood out. Mm -hmm. And I had a sister <coughs> who passed away from breast cancer. Her name was Melanie. And then I thought about the was it a, a finger in the pointy? Why would my sister be named Melanie? Was that, and she was a petroleum engineer. She dealt with the chemistry of black oil. And she was also was a black panther. So I used to be, but it, all these little signatures. But the, uh, but I think with, well, our owners have done a great work, Dr. Men, Dr. Clark, and others, and all the long line of people who've gone before us, and to pass this torch on to the next generation so they can continue, keep it going is right. what it's all about. Exactly. And, uh, and so it, it's quite quite a story. Mm -hmm. So I think that, I, th I really do feel there's something going on with other dimensions, mm -hmm. and but it is, you qualify by your, the quality of your heart and you qualify a very complex thing. That complex thing is called sweat. <laughs> By trying over and over and over and over and over again. And so there's there's the, the effort factor. And so I'm 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 hoping I'm I plan to stay here long, longer. But I know I just will celebrate each and every day and so I'm so glad to hear that our friends and family are taking care of our illustrious ones who's made a way for us. Mm -hmm. And I know they will attend to whatever it needs to attend to, to, attend to because that was, it's been fabulous. Hey, and I could not, the answers are in those books. I didn't even see it, honey. As, as long as I said, well, how did, how did he put up with me all these years? Asking the same questions over and again. And he politely endured me. You know, endured so many of our students, you know, so hey. But I don't remember coming from Egypt the last time. I was flown here and flown at the ray of a plane, brought here by a lady, delivered 
by what, who, where, when, what date. I don't know. I don't have a date. I can't tell you. Who? I didn't bring them over. We just met them. Okay. <laughs> well, I don't know because I don't know where I am. I don't know where I am. And tonight, when I was told by Dr. Woods, I was coming here, and he was going to bring me by holding me. <laughs> I was afraid. <laughs> and when he brought me down the step to go to the taxi, I don't know how to make it. I, I said this. I didn't come because I felt confident of coming. Mm -hmm. I came because I respected him and was afraid to say no. We're glad you came. We're glad you're here. <laughs> the uh, no, I would have been at your door wherever way you were. I would have been coming to visit you tomorrow on my own, man. And I'm so glad that with Dr. Lewis coming, the Spirit's blessed you to be able to find find the way. Mm -hmm. And speak good. And speaking good. Yeah, speaking good and clear. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Clear. Speaking good. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. Mm -hmm. It's quite a blessing, Doc. And yes. well. Mm -hmm. yes. That's Enjoy great. His food. Mm -hmm. It's like old times. Mm -hmm. Just like old times. But Doc, you know, uh, you have a guardian now, so he's probably paying all the bills. Mm -hmm. The court assigned you a guardian, so he must be taking care of the rent and everything else, so you don't have to worry about it. And I don't pay rent, mm -hmm. so no, somebody you, well, he, yeah. Okay. So I'm sure that's part of his job, you know, to pay your expenses. I know who he is. He is an Englishman who's a black man. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and he is the man that's responsible for O.J. Simpson. Oh, what you say? The well, man that got the bail for O.J. Simpson. Oh, he's good. He, 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 <laughs> well, he's part of the He's part of Cochran's son. Oh, oh, man, yeah. He's part of Cochran. Oh, okay. Mr. White. Mr. White, okay. H-Y-T-E. Okay. He is the man that got O.J. Simpson back in jail. I know. I read it on the street. When I get on the street, I read many things besides the news. And so I know a lot of things. There's a friend named Carnation. Mm -hmm. It's supposed to be my my great great grand, grand uncle, great grandson, something like that. And we meet on this basis. And he said jewelry in front of the Nana food store where I go. It's right on the other side at the building where I live. But suddenly today. <coughs> He, he disappeared. He's supposed to show up today, but he don't show. <laughs> but no way, but and they call him in the house as they call he is home. <laughs> Why well Lou, I was waiting on you. Are you coming today? No, Doc, I decided not to come today. I said, Why not today? And he reason he says, no, my dog doesn't feel good. He's old. <laughs> 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 I got a new dog. <laughs> so I said, your dog suddenly got ill. <laughs> I just said, I'll tell you, one thing I just said, look, you not can live forever. It's impossible. Yeah, that's not true. And all I'm going to do is try to live till tomorrow morning. Yes. Mm -hmm. If I don't live, you bury me.
Individuals name is Professor Allen, mm -hmm. and uh, we met him a number of years ago. Sister Hyde and others knew him before we did in African Open Africa, uh, and others. Doctor Professor Allen is in Uganda. He's been there about a year. He'll be coming back in August. When he comes back in August, he's going to spend one year here in the states. He's about six, 59 years of age, and uh, he's at your college, so he, he's spending one year in Uganda. He's coming back, he's, he left last June he's to Uganda, and he's coming back in August. He got uh, to Uganda originally through the organization African Up in Africa, but specifically Brother Dix and his wife, mm -hmm. who invited him over to Uganda for a conference. Because of his invitation by, Dr., uh, by Brother Dix, he went to Uganda. Now, Professor Allen, is, he's traveled through most of Africa. He's been in the war, etc. So he's an experienced individual, African-based individual. His uh, specialty is history. But he uh, indicated it was as a result of Dr. Ben primarily, who, and Dr. Clark and others, who really pushed him into the historical point of view. So he's been in Uganda since last June. He'll be back in August. When he comes back in August, he's going to stay one year to give your uh, college back NYU. that, which one? NYU. NYU. Whichever one of the colleges, back one year of uh, sabbatical that they gave him to go there. Mm -hmm. As a result of the trip with Brother Dix in that conference, the number of the brothers and part of the government invited him back to Uganda, that's where he is now, to teach at the university some of the university students and some of their students that's going to go into foreign service. So when he comes back in August, he'll give us information and he's going back. The thing about it is, when he goes back, we're going to help him build a educational center. And his primary focus is on the Twa. He says what he's going to attempt to do is to add on that bit of information, that bit of history that Dr. Ben has started in terms of the Twa coming out of Central Africa. So right now, that's more than what he does. He does the educational aspect of it at the university for two days, and then the rest of the days he spends with the Twa. 
he gave us some information about them. He said they, they have their own indigenous languages. They live primarily up in the hills. And he says he's getting to you know, work with them. They haven't, he hasn't worked his way in yet for them to start teaching the language. So I just wanted to say it's a, we had an opportunity in meeting Professor Allen through Sister Esther Hyde and others, Dr. Hyde, that he, his specific quest, and that's what he's going to finish his PhD, he's, he says he's going to stay in Uganda, we're going to help him build a city, to try to build that informational base on the Twa to kind of add to what Doc and everybody has mentioned here. So I just wanted to say that it, uh, it, it's paying off the things that we're doing. I was here when you had the reception for him, the sending off. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, it was good. And yeah. uh, the key thing is that uh, when he comes back, mm -hmm. we'll get a briefing from him. He'll be here, yeah. And we're going to try to provide him, the African, open African, others, with whatever he needs when he goes back to build a center in terms of computers and slides and other things like that. And what he had indicated to us was right now the biggest problem is that the university students do not see Uganda or Africa as the center. Mm -hmm. They still see Europe and England as the center. Mm -hmm. So that's what he said that impressed them in terms of the students and that, uh, you know, he's going to do the best he can to add to help that. Hopefully, uh, with the financial meltdown of Europe, the African countries and these students will begin to see a big change. <laughs> you know, it's very difficult to, uh, you know, I just, I'll just end on this point here, uh, whether, however they do it. They said Shangarai and Zimbabwe and Mugabe are both in Tanzania. And Shangarai is supposed to be sitting with the Western countries asking for aid. Mm -hmm. And Mugabe is with the other African countries putting together Comesa and inter-African trade. Because now they're saying, the African Union and others are saying that they now, Africa, now have to restructure their economy away from Europe and the West and start trading much more within each other so that they can prosper. So, so these things are, some of these things are happening in a the, in the very positive way. So the juxtaposition is uh, Mugabe is there talking Pan-Africanism and trying to integrate the economy. And Shanghai mm -hmm. is there begging Europeans, mm -hmm. and they're broke. <laughs> okay, so I'll just mention that. Now. So when Professor Ali comes back, you know, we'll have the meetings and everything, and that's really just like they're doing in Ghana and others. It's really a key that we were able to get an individual like Professor Allen to be on the ground and to deal specifically with the Twa. Mm -hmm. it's, it's great. It's okay. really good. Mm -hmm. Okay, anyone else? This is not a, this is like a local issue, but um, today we were at Dr. Gates thing about the uh, Africans were um, collaborators in the, in the enslavement. And one of the things that he said we, there is no, was no transatlantic slavery. It's really European enslavement and we should change the name. And he really gave a history of the slave, the slave trading and, you know, to discount. He said they're always collaborators, you know. The, um, the Jews collaborated with the Germans and stuff like that. But in talking about um, Professor Gates, my concern is that he's on the search committee for the chamber <coughs> for, to get for the um, oh, another the director. director. And uh, th th that's just my concern. I don't know what Dr. King think about that. Well, that's right. well, it's the same yeah. <laughs> That's a problem. It is. We get, we get in the search committee. Ask yourself why the president of the of, of the museum is resigning. Yeah. Well, he's retiring in Retire. February next it, year. Yeah, February. February. Next year. Are you wrapping up? How do you put it? It's coming on the museum. Oh. And the president of the museum is resigning. So Gates is going to take his place. No, no, no. But he's on the committee. He's a possibility. No, no, he's, he's on the search committee. He's on the Just as um, uh, Viola Palmer said, you know, it's all right to sit and listen to these things, but what do we do about it? That's right. You see? He may be on the search committee, but it would seem that there are things that the community becomes involved, mm -hmm. and particularly in view of this situation, the statement that he's made, mm -hmm. 
he is the last person <laughs> who should have anything to do with the Schomburg. But that's, that's just like with the burial ground, you know, right, right, my friend here? No, the, the, with burial ground, a lot of us been run up and down with the burial ground. And now the committee and the burial ground have no blacks. Isn't that so? Have no blacks. Mm -hmm. Have no blacks. Well, no, no, no. I, I want to say this. Uh, May I just say this? That we as Africans have to be organized and ready. Yeah. You know, don't get caught short when they present this European to be over the Schomburg, mm -hmm. our history. Be ready. There was a struggle the last time for him, for Howard, and, there's, and I'm sure there's going to be a struggle this time, but we, we should be prepared for it. And there's no professional qualified black person at any of the um, Museum, Museum of Natural History, Metropolitan Museum of Art. Oh, yes. There's yes. not yes. one. Not one. Mm -hmm. Not one. Mm -hmm. And, and fact, all of this is by design. Of course. And, of course. and I don't know why we can't put you up. You are art historian. Yes. With That's a degree. right. That would be something. That would be something. That, yes. yes. I don't see why. Yes, all right. I don't see why either. Mm -hmm. Okay. I don't see why. What does it take? Organizing and, and, and being out there with, with masters of people. That That's makes right. sense. That's right. Replacing him with the woman, with with another African and with a woman on top of it. But mm -hmm. well, we should start right there. That's what I'm saying. We better start. The process is mm -hmm. so that we know that we. That's right. More than reacting to it. This, that, or the other. Mm -hmm. We have to find out what the process is. Well, then maybe we need to set up a committee to, to get him off so. the co uh, of the search we, committee. Maybe we to need to, maybe we need to set up a committee mm -hmm. to find out all the things that is required for us to be prepared you know, to take on this struggle. Okay. So we continue. Always. It's never end. We can continue. Yes, sir. Can you ask for a motion? Yeah. Do you need one? Are you driving? I'm I'm well, well, we can get one person from African Open Africans to represent the group. Okay. Not necessarily myself, but we can find somebody. So it's sort of be an organizational thing to say this organization is backing this particular person. Yeah. Uh, uh, Sister, uh, Sister I, you have an organization? Mm -hmm. Okay, can we get? Can we count on you? Yeah. Okay, that's good. That's already two. Any other organizations here? But I'm sure we can because uh, uh, Sister Betty and, and uh, they had to leave. Mm -hmm. But I'm sure we can get somebody from Similar Town. Mm -hmm. Maybe somebody from the South of 12. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, yes, I'm sure that. And I'll mention it to a board meeting at National Conference of Artists this week. Yeah, I was oh, thinking that you yeah. were oh, in a position to. Girl, I don't miss you all tonight. <laughs> I watch you every, every Saturday oh. night, you know. Oh, okay. Yeah, what reality themselves, mm -hmm. and they are trying to, and they, this whole thing with the internet, I'm fearful of their taking control of written in books, burning them books, editing the books, and limiting what is <laughs> on right. the internet. That's, that's right. right. On all kind of twists and turns. Mm -hmm. Especially on Wikipedia. And, and, and just trying to twist it all around. Mm -hmm. And our children who now look to the internet, it has, like, in our gen, my generation, we're looking for, to TV to educate them. Mm -hmm. yeah. Next generation after us is looking for the internet. Mm -hmm. But the correct thing would be, again, to teach us how to become fluent in these, in our own tongues, speaking and written, mm -hmm. and we'll go back to read, and talk to living people. Mm -hmm. So this thing about talking to the twa is of fundamental importance. Mm -hmm. Reading the Medu next when I read like Dr. Men's books, he has photographs mm -hmm. of all of these things. To get past the speculation, he takes you back to the source. Mm -hmm. And there's a dialogue once you hear those words or see those visual emery. They say nothing of the smells mm -hmm. or the touches or the fabric or the colors mm -hmm. that turn on, for want of a better word, no, say the other word, which is the 
the coup and the ka and the ba, mm -hmm. or the collective unconscious, those are all different names, so that you have a dialogue with your ancestral oceans, mm -hmm. and all those things can flow to you in the here and now. Mm -hmm. And so that's to have that kind of person to be efficient. Mentioning the melanin and the dream state, someone was telling me recently, I don't know if it's true or not, but I need to ask you that uh, when it comes to healing, healing does not really occur in the state where you have visual dreams. But uh, if you go beyond that, there's a state of, um, of peace in your sleep where the healing occurs and not in the dreams. Is that well, true? There's, you know, there's a thing of the sleep having four different phases that you can identify by looking at the, the EEG, the electrical recording to the brain. Mm -hmm. But that's European talk again. That's because that's to not taking into account all the other small oscillations that take place on the scope. And you have to really get a clean room where you're not being bombarded by the oh, ways yes, all the other communications that are ongoing. Mm -hmm. But so it's hard to know what the real deal is. But the uh, but in the, the, so the, sleep, the phase of sleep in which you have dreams is in, I think it's in, it's in, um, in phase, there's three, two stages between stage two and three where you have the rapid eye movement sleep. And you can, that's when you can have conscious recall of your dream content. Mm -hmm. But like I said, when I was into that deep nod, when I was, mm -hmm. have four seconds and I was getting real out about, it felt so sweet asleep. <laughs> I would dare to venture it might have been a stage three or a stage four. Mm -hmm. Now the question of healing is a very complex question. Mm -hmm. It's because when I hear about the healing that takes place with the, uh, with the neurogenesis, the growing of new nerves, new blast cells mm -hmm. that originate in the epidermis lining the cerebrospinal ventricular fluid, especially in the lateral ventricles. Mike are taking, going through a 21-day journey, passing through the basal ganglia, and then if there's not too much rage or depression, being able to send and seeding the cortical cortex with new levels of organization. And so looking upon an individual nerve cell as a vast galaxy of multiple neural connections, synaptic dendritic connections, one nerve cell may have a million different connections. And that's but the fourth stage. That's that is the that is a I think a healing phase mm -hmm. that runs through 21 days. I and from my point of view, as I, I'm not just uninformed, but I would I care to venture the healing takes place 24/7. Mm -hmm. You know, you can talk about hearing something that promote you to change or, or heal or cast off demons, mm -hmm. but then to hear it, by the time you've heard it, you might have perceived it even before it was even said. Mm -hmm. And by the time you hear it, then it has to hit, it has to catch you at the quotes at the ripe time. A window in which there is a many things are in alignment that can then bring about a new synthesis bring about a, a transformation, so to speak. And so I don't know that, I don't know the answer to that, Sister Jer Dr. Jeffries. I, 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 uh, I'm of the inclination that healing is a 24-7 phenomenon. Mm -hmm. And the parts that we're blessed even to see that we can document, that's one thing, but the different aspects of it. Um, and also, I, it seems like healing is not Many times they, I, I don't give it another example. I had a lady the other day, who I, one of my patients I called twice a day to check on her blood pressure and glucose levels. Her mother and her brother both died within three months of each other. And so she had lived with them all of her adult life. And she was totally dependent upon them. Upon them. And she was totally disabled. And it was a very loving family, but with but I was fearful that without her mother and her brother was a primary supporter, that without that family there, she was going to fall apart. She wouldn't last but a short time. 
but she has done well. And she gets off her diet from time to time. <coughs> but she had a dream. She said, she said, I had a dream, Dr. King. This lady's 55 years old, so she's past menopause. She says, I had a dream that I was pregnant. Huh? And she patted her rotund stomach. She's overweight. She says, I knew that wasn't. <laughs> but I've heard of the dream of the of the spiritual marriage and the giving birth to the new self or moving mm -hmm. up to a higher plane. Mm -hmm. So to me that was a sign that she was healing. healing. Mm -hmm. And she was a new she was being reborn mm -hmm. with a higher level of integration. And she she lived in her family as a person who was bright but she had been sexually molested by a woman that she refused to ever admit mm -hmm. when she was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. She was sexually assaulted later when she was 21. Mm -hmm. and so that was a tremendous traumatic event. Mm -hmm. And so she was been labeled schizoaffective, schizophrenia, bipolar, and all of these various <coughs> things. But she's going through it, and she had, when she took classes in the university, she made straight A's. Mm -hmm. And then our mother said, no, you need to be here to see me, to watch over me, and take care of me 24-7. And brother, you need to do that. Mm -hmm. So then she fell back into the dependent mode. <coughs> and now that both of them are no longer here, it's, she wonder, what am I going to do with my life? Mm -hmm. Go back to school. Go back to school, and then what am I going to do then? And to, so realize that, that if you've been blessed with good things, then you have to move on from being a recipient mm -hmm. to a healer. Mm -hmm. You've got to give right. and, and we'll climb your ladder. Mm -hmm. You've passed through a, th and that word threshold is another word for initiation, another word for um, enzymatic, where you're able to go, you tunnel, and you need less energy to, then, to accomplish a lot of miraculous events. Mm -hmm. So to pass through a threshold, that you then catapult and leap several steps, steps in one to a higher level of living. And then one last word on this journey of life as we pass through the different doors. That's quite a story. These different doors, the marriage door, the family door. Realize we belong to a spiritual order. Here we're in the history club. And we're with our fellow soldiers and soldierettes in the history. And we're all given certain talents. And we're carrying the story of our people to spread the word. So there can be a healing of the self-identity. A, a reorientation back to our purpose. What are we going to do with it? Where do we come? Where are we going? What are we going to do with all of this? How are we going to do this and still not get the big head and get scandalous and crazy mm -hmm. and want the big house, the big car, the big money, all the mm -hmm. ego trips, you know? How are we going to deal with that and still be able to sit at Pam Pam where there was a Pam Pam? <laughs> how, how are we going to sit with the crew and talk trash, you know? <laughs> and talk sweet to heart, and hip talk, you know? and communicate, and then receive blessed ideas from ways that you wouldn't even expect. Mm -hmm. Sometimes I say, oh, hey, I was in a place the other day and a man came in, he looked homeless and I was tightening up. I said, wait a minute, brother, that might be God walking through the door. Mm -hmm. What you talking about, mm -hmm. brother? Right. You can't go in your pocket and give a dollar? Mm -hmm. So I remember Doc so many times, I was so thoroughly impressed, he would bring his last dollar, he'd give it away to all this, mm -hmm. the people. And I said, man, I couldn't do that. Yeah. I wouldn't do that. But he was giving, and it had an effect decades later. You're looking for immediate return. And then somebody, sometimes when people come to me now, and they don't have the fee to pay, I said, well, I've been paid in advance already. Mm -hmm. I'm going to work. I got, a, I got a special payment plan for you. Mm -hmm. I can work with you mm -hmm. and do what we can. If I have been given the breath of life, to see a new day, let me yes. try to find something. Oh, right. mm -hmm. All right. Yes, Dr. You know, I just wanted if you could comment. In Vanuatu, in the South Pacific, our people 
for the most part, are heavily melanated. And they live in the rural areas, the bush. They're on mountains, and you know, you've got these stars. You see thousands of stars. And we were told, and we had a brief experience, that people, this is the comment I want you to comment on, that people, they know certain people can go from a human to animal form and back, primarily in birds. That certain people at certain times can fly. Um, that there was a priest who told us that he knows where the dead lives. Visit but he could not tell us, he wasn't allowed to tell us what they ate. And there was a priest that said to us that he tread, he moved to, he, he, he went to uh, Iraq and saw the devastation of what the U.S. did and it was terrible and he came back. Can you comment on any of these things? When I went to with Dr. Ben, in the went to we went to Luxor. That was in the year 1979. After that train ride, Doc. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so, and we went to Luxor. We went into the tomb of Ramses the Sixth. Now, my dear wife Paulette had, before I even gone, had bought a copy of the book Ramses the Sixth by Alexandre Pionkinov, and they had different scenes. One of the scenes was six figures, black stick figures, in wavy waters. Mm. And I said, what does that mean? I wonder, I wish I could find out what that means. So that was an image in Kemet. And then I saw a book that had been written by the average, so-called Aboriginal people in Australia. And I saw the same scene, mm. the black wavy waters, and stick figures in the water. Mm. And I heard one of the Aboriginal people talking about it, said it referred to people in a trance state. A, not a dream state, but whatever the word trance, and that's the word, I don't know what that means. Trance state. And that people can then, could take on different, can incarnate or take on different forms. And they could materialize and dematerialize. And then the works of Edgar Casey, who talked about while in a dream or trance state, he could project his mind to any place on the planet Earth and go in underwater, through ground, whatever, and then retrieve whatever he saw while moving in the spirit realm. So hearing all that, and then my recent experience, though I would not say I, I'm, I don't know what that was all about, that I would not deny it. And to hear that people call, again, this other person uh, who was the, who wrote 777, I blocked on the name again, uh, who was a English person who was a below to the, uh, the uh, an occult group that was magicians and all, but he was also toe up on the floor with his sexual identity and also heavy duty on drugs. Alistair Crawley was his name, spoke about his master Theron who lived on the star Cyrus materializing in his hotel room someplace while he was visiting in Egypt in the 1920s. So the concept that people could materialize and dematerialize even across huge voices of space and time, I'm of the opinion that's reality. That's where you ask them how you do it, on what level you do it, and how to be organized, preparing yourself steps of development. I'm, I'm fairly certain that is, that's attainable. Uh, but then again, I'm also pragmatic and saying, well, I know once in my exploratory days, when I was a young, younger and bigger fool, hope I've reduced that some as I've lived. I was living in L.A. in the hood, and I was doing chemical experimentation called LSD. So they had a thing called uh, purple haze, and purple haze was a little small BB, like a little small purple BB. 
And I and so I went out and the committee had this mighty brought up a ship on a purple way in South Central Los Angeles. So I went out to my cousin Cardell and my other cousin, Brother Abdul from San Francisco. We went out there and we bought us a, a little supply of Pearl Hayes. I said, well, I'm gonna buy, I bought, they cost $10 a pill and I got five or six pills. And I said, man, I'm gonna give each one of us one. And after an hour it passed, nothing had happened. <laughs> I said, this is a scoundrel, man. He sold me some junk and got my money. Ooh wee. So I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to take one and a half more uh -oh. and give them a half each. <laughs> and like a fool, I took it. And then I'm, I was driving the car, mm -hmm. got off the freeway, came to the stop sign, and suddenly the light turned into a rosy red. It felt so warm, I could feel the heat coming through the window. I said, oh, man. Here we go. And so I drove on home, but then the chemical thing was unleashed. And I began to have the visions. I began to retrieve memories from the distant past. And I began to have brilliant revelations. I mean, you know, there's sometimes we have fear about thinking certain combinations. We had to push past fear. But then I said, oh, well, well you did all that. What make you think that you won't fly if you jump out that window? You ought to try it. Yeah, you can fly, man. Don't you feel light? Then come, I'll come back to it. It was like, yes, no. It was like by, it was like digital, flipping between left brain, right brain, back and forth, back and forth. But I'm saying all that to say that that's an example of the chemical brain having keys to other kinds of, of linking up other kinds of association between neurons. So there's standard neuronal paths that are conditioned by our society that saying this is proper thinking. And so that part of part of the uh, of the I think of the mental slavery is to, for us to accept the world as the oppressor sees it with his defective mentation. He doesn't want us to look at our other potentialities with our heavily melanated systems. We should dismiss that as crazy thinking or crazy thoughts. But our brothers who have been raised in isolation, where they've been able to go through a school of exact study and self-reflection and, and then made new associations. So I think that's real and it, and it will come forward as we, as, we, as we ask these questions and we need to go back and talk at length to the people who are more skilled in that and to the degree, because many times they will not reveal that because you're not initiating the group, but to whatever we can, we need to then share it amongst ourselves and look at our own different states and see what it is. So I think we're on a whole edge of rediscovery. And now we don't, we take away black as a sign of inferiority. We see, you know, black is a sign of a divine gift that allows you to have to unleash the genie in your bottle, <laughs> you, know, so you can fly into who knows how many dimensions. You can take on how many different materializations. And then asking the question for the, for the betterment of our community, for the betterment of our pursuit of a, of a right life and a noble life. And knowing that and, and in, in all of that is the message, take care of your family. Take care of your community. Take care of your mate. Take care. I hear to hear a dog going through the struggles with his children is a painful thing. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I also have, have witnessed the sacrifices that our leaders make when they're gone all of the time, and the children develop an anger mm -hmm. towards my big daddy who's done these great things, but he's not here for me for this moment, mm -hmm. and so they. They have that resentment. I don't know if that was an issue with you. My mind have gradually told me about my stuff. <laughs> so it's a question, my, my brother. Yes. Yeah. Um, I don't know exactly if the, uh, how to blame the past is more, more for the future. Blame for the future. He asked the question, do we have to blame the past or the future? 
blame the past or blame for the future? Well, I think all of those are linked together. They're the same. That the past, as Dr. Ben and Dr. Clark have said, is a compass. It tells us from where we have come. And it defines the path of where we must go. We got some works to continue that have been an ongoing work in progress through the thousands, if not millions, if not billions or trillions of years. There's, there's a path of our life seed. And there have been things that have 